and uh, we have people from uh, different parts of the world as usual joining a um, couple of things about the call and mauli uh, thanks for joining the call today is sunday july 17th it's 8 pm in india and of course it is early morning in the us so what i do mauli is i run through a quick presentation is about three or four slides and then after that uh, we'll start the discussion with you and i'll walk you through the format as we go through the call okay sure uh, so some few guidelines for those who might be joining first time please stay muted during the fireside chat session uh, we don't want any external uh, disturbances please turn off your video the entire session is recorded molly we record the entire session and put it in our public youtube channel so people can watch it a lot of uh, alumni and students watch the recording at their leisure you may get questions from them after much better after the call as well um, if you have any questions during the session please use the slido program so slido is a free program on the internet uh, uh, shortly i'll talk about how to use slido uh, what slido allows us to do is for the audience to ask questions live while the speaker is in session it also allows me as a host to do some real time polling to get feedback from the audience as well so there will be periodic live polls in slido please participate in the poll and during the question and answer session uh, you, you can put the questions in slido whenever you want to and at the end of the session before we when we start moving into the audience q and a um, i will go through the list and what if you join slido you can also <coughs> see it actually everybody can see everybody else's question uh, so during q and a if your name is called please unmute and ask your question okay so today's guest speaker is dr mauli vaidyanathan mauli is my classmate from the 1985 batch from production and he's based in uh, minneapolis united states uh, I'm the host, and of course, Partha is the tech support as usual. Uh, today's Slido session, uh, the Slido uh, code number is 3979056. Partha will be putting out this code periodically for those who join late. All you have to do, whether it's your internet browser in your laptop, desktop, iPad, iPad, iPhone, or any other mobile phone, just go to the browser and type slido.com. In the first screen, you just enter this particular code and you will be in a slido session and it will look like this basically so you'll have a q and a tab and a polls tab you can toggle between them in the q and a tab you can write a question whenever you want when you go to the polls tab you will see the real time polls i have a question right now in the polls tab i don't know if all of you have seen it you can respond to that poll and also any subsequent questions and polls that i push through the system okay so that's the end of my presentation. So I'm going to close this down, people, and then uh, we'll get on to the call. So there we go. OK, so Molly, welcome to the call. Uh, what we're going to do first is that the first, uh, say, 20, 25 minutes, I want to give it to you for, uh, for you to describe several things. Uh, what we would like you to talk about is your journey from the time you left CEG back in 1985 to now. And what we would like you to focus on is on, while describing your experiences through the last uh, years, significant learnings, uh, significant experiences, significant learnings that you may want to pass on to other alumni and students that you think might be beneficial to them. Because in a course of several decades, you obviously have gone through a lot of, uh, uh, lot of uh, experiences. And in Molly's case, that's what all of you are aware, Molly has been an employee as well as an entrepreneur. So he has a good combination of working for a company as well as building his own business. And and also Molly has, was a world-class table tennis player in his uh, college days. So perhaps you can also talk about that, Molly, a little bit uh, as part of your call. Over to you, Molly. Thanks, uh, Vish. Uh, thanks to uh, uh, all of you uh, for joining this uh, session. And uh, I must... Uh, uh, would you say recognize uh, wish for being such a uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, CEG supporter and a CEG community organizer and uh, CEG alumni that uh, is trying to make the CEG uh, ecosystem uh, more whole and more well-rounded. One second, Molly. Uh, uh, one second, Molly. What, Partha, are you recording the session now? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Molly. Sorry. Just want to check. Go ahead. So, um, uh, chronologically, I will go a little bit, as uh, Vish had said. 
during my college days, um, I would uh, during my Gindi engineering college days, uh, I was I would say I would de describe myself more as a table tennis player than a student. Uh, and I think Wish would also uh, agree with me. I probably spent uh, uh, less time in the college and more time playing uh, for India and, and, and other places. With the result, uh, I uh, used to come just for the exams, maybe two, three months before the exams, cram everything and uh, get it all uh, put together. So then once uh, I graduated, uh, I said, hey, what do I do? And I was uh, lucky enough to get a research assistance research assistantship uh, with the University of Wisconsin. And uh, I did my master's. And uh, again, while I was doing my master's, um, a company, uh, I did a project with them. And on on, on uh, interesting product, making ice creams. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the as you know, Wisconsin uh, is one of the dairy capitals or a dairy state. Uh, and uh, ice cream is is, uh, is made quite a bit uh, uh, there. And one of the companies uh, I was, uh, what do you say, doing a project with, uh, made me build build a heat exchanger uh, while I was a student. And then uh, right after I finished my master's, they they uh, hired me. Uh, to to be part of their team and then uh, I I wasn't satisfied uh, with just working for them so uh, because it was uh, fairly what do you say uh, rudimentary engineering work that I was doing uh, and so I went and got my PhD while I was uh, working with them as well and then uh, I graduated uh, in 19. Uh, January 1994, and uh, my professor, uh, I, I don't know, Wish, if you remember, uh, the book that we used for metal casting uh, was uh, the book written by my professor, Carl Loper. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. Book. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. I didn't and know that Carl, was of your, your college, though. I didn't know that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Car Carl was my uh, uh, thesis advisor. Uh, in Wisconsin as well. So he and I started a company uh, along with another uh, uh, person when I graduated. And uh, that company lasted for about three and a half years. And I was the the grunt, technical grunt, while the, while, uh, the other two were uh, the business and the financing people. And we grew fairly rapidly. Uh, from almost uh, zero customers to 150 customers by uh, 1997. So in three, four years, we we had uh, 150 customers, very uh, reasonably profitable. Um, and right about that time, uh, another big company came and bought us all out. And I was a minority owner at that time. Uh, and so um, although I had some say, I didn't have uh, any say in the sale of the of the company. So then I went to work for uh, Texas Instruments uh, from 1997, I think July or August I joined. And then through uh, uh, 2008, I was with uh, TI. I uh, rose from uh, a senior engineer uh, at TI to um, managing their yield engineering uh, department at the uh, 65 nanometer node. Uh, just to give you some uh, some uh, reference, uh, six, today I think uh, in what, 14 years between 2008 and now the 65 nanometers is extremely old and obsolete technology. They are right now at three nanometers. So uh, I left TI in 2008. Uh, to join uh, Seagate, uh, that didn't go well because um, there were some uh, major uh, corporate level uh, issues I had with uh, the leadership team. Uh, that so that lasted only six months, and then I started my company 
uh, solar pod in 2009 and I've been in business ever since. Uh, the learning, uh, th that's the chronological uh, stuff that uh, I can give. Uh, the overall picture, uh, I would say uh, there are three things that I would, uh, are important that learnings that I would say um, has given me in the 30 plus years I've been uh, working. Uh, one of them is the word and, A-N-D. I wish I had known that word more. Uh, we all know that more, uh, you know, uh, in, in English uh, terms. But uh, the word and is very, 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 very important to me. What that means is there is, uh, there is nothing that you should not do. You should try to do everything. And that's what that word and means. Uh, you must bring in as much energy as possible to everything that you can do. Uh, and uh, it should not be a transactional and. A transactional and is an and where I am giving you something and I'm going to get something out of it. And if I can get out of that transactional and, you will or I will be more whole and I will be very, 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 uh, what do you say, uh, fulfilled is the right word. So that's the one, one thing that uh, uh, I have brought. The second thing or, or learning, I, second thing I would say is um, uh, uh, the, the, we all very, uh, we don't give too much weight to luck. Luck is an extremely important component. When you combine and and luck, what happens is you are there in a position all the time. That's what and gives you. The luck is when the circumstance comes and meets you at that, at that time. Those are, uh, and luck is not, it can be in both ways. When I, I want to be very clear, luck does not mean only good luck. You can have bad luck also, a lot of bad luck also. You, you may decide to go one direction and the actual outcomes can be very, very different. And when it is, when it, when it goes in the wrong direction, it does not mean that you have made a bad decision. It just means that at the time you made the decision, you took a chance on a certain path. And in most cases, the uncontrollable variables uh, determine the outcome. So those uh, luck and, and the last thing is uh, very, very, uh, I, I put a lot of weight to that as well. That is uh, the, the importance for earning, yearning and learning. All three are important. That means, I mean, to give you uh, uh, an analogy, my yearning is to serve the sun. As you know, the sun is the star, is the uh, only thing that powers this planet. For me to work directly for the sun instead of everything else, everything else that we do in the world is a derivative of the sun. You and I are talking because of the energy that is derived from the sun through either a fossil fuel method or a hydro method or whatever method that, that may be. So that is the passion or the yearning that I, that I want to bring to the table. To, to tell you one little story which may remember or not, uh, my final year paper in 1985 was actually on solar energy. And uh, I mean, lo and behold, I, I had that passion all through and I still do. I, that uh, I believe that the sun is the real uh, uh, fuel, real engine for all of the things that we do. And the passion that I get from serving the sun is, is unquestionable. The second thing is learning. I, by doing this, I, I learned today that 
you know, data centers are being built in India. And me as a energy guy, I want to make that data center as sustainable, as green as possible. And so perhaps during this call or somewhere, you know, I have the technology to provide those, those kinds of infrastructure. Now, you know, how do we all come together to make that happen is, is the learning portion of my, my interest. And lastly is the earning. I mean, we all want to eventually not lose money. I mean, I don't want to become a very rich man, but at the same time, I don't want to lose money. I want to make sure that there is a business interest. There is a, 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 a gain for all of us in this process. So with that, I mean, did I uh, summarize uh, things yeah. Uh, yeah. reasonably or I mean, I can go on. Uh, in, uh, once you give me a so soapbox, uh, I can go on and on. I, and I don't want this to be a monologue either. And I want. No, no, to I, I think it's good that we normally do this in the first part of the session because uh, two things. One is it gives the ability for the speaker to speak freely on the way they want to do it. Second thing, it also touches upon things that people want to ask questions about. So I think it's good. Uh, I think it gave a good idea about your your. Uh, journey from the time you left CEG and also the highlights and lowlights. Interestingly, lot, not many speakers talk about the lowlights. <laughs> uh, I can so, talk about the low life too. Then I'm saying I, this. I, have, uh, I mean, just to give you a quick uh, low life uh, thing, I am the only uh, person who took a Fortune 500 company to, to court and won. <laughs> That's so, a pretty amazing achievement actually. Exactly. So, uh, and and uh, it's a you know, and it is also a one of a kind case. Uh, the the case is the 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 case is of uh, how corporate America lies to employees. Mm. And uh, I, I mean, so I can if you want me to talk on that, I can go on and on on that as well. So interesting. Okay, so very nice, uh, very nice model, good combination. I have a few questions I want to start off with and then we will uh, let people ask the questions as they go on. Uh, one of my first questions is that, you know, you obviously were a table tennis player in your college days, a very successful one. Now, CEG is known to have a lot of successful sports people, as you know, we have cricket players, we have uh, uh, tennis players, etc. all come from CEG in the, over, the, over the period of time. What, how, what is the learnings and what are the, what are the experiences and learnings you gained as a table tennis player that came to help you later on in life? Any, anything that particularly you can discuss? Oh, very, very good question. I mean, I, I lean on that all the time. I mean, people don't, I mean, just uh, when I played table tennis at those high levels, I practiced probably thousands of hours but the matches I played were only few minutes or few hours. Those thousands of hours that I've done preparing myself for the match is typically not given that much of uh, weight. So today when I prepare for anything, it gives me that says, hey, I need 10x or 20x pre-preparation for whatever I want to do that needs that level of, what do you say, uh, importance. So what table tennis taught me was that in order to go into that excellence category, you have to be, you have to prepare a lot. Yeah. And, you know, I, I lean, I mean, when I played table tennis, uh, the, the sentence what Martina Navratilova said, and I don't, I think these young kids probably don't even know who Martina is. Do you know, I mean, wish you probably know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you all, any of you know who Martina Navratilova was or is? She lives, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. She has won, I think, uh, about 15 Grand Slams uh, tennis ch championships in, in her, and her, 
her um, statement was when I played table tennis was an extraordinary player is a player who does ordinary things extraordinarily well. That means you have to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. So to, to answer your question, Vish, uh, what I learned from my table tennis days, and I still continue that, is I want to prepare as much as possible. Sometimes my preparation may come short, you know, uh, and so be it. But that should not stop me from my preparation. Mm. Okay, interesting. Uh, the second question I had is regarding more about business. You know, this is uh, something that I wanted to ask you because you are a non-computer science person. Many of our uh, engineers, including many from our batch and many from subsequent batches, regardless of whichever stream of engineering that they studied in college, uh, both in bachelor's as well as in master's, ended up in the IT field. Whether out of choice or otherwise, I don't know, but most people ended up in IT. Uh, to the extent that sometimes you start to ask the question that what well, those core engineering curriculums uh, made any difference at all in that. Now you, one of the few who are stuck to your engineering background and continue to work in engineering. Uh, I just want to get an idea of what does it, uh, how do you, what do you, what do you feel about it? What is your views on that? And more specifically, what would be an advice you'd be giving to a young engineer who is now in college or just graduated with an engineering degree in a core curry, core stream to look forward to? Again, a very thoughtful uh, question, uh, Vish. Um, what makes a society a successful society? There are three things in that. One is food. Second is water. Mm. And the third is energy. Mm. It is not computer science. It's not IT. It is not um, aircraft engines. It's not uh, building aircrafts or automobiles. Mm. The, a society when these three things, these basic things, that is food, water, and energy are in abundance, like in the US, these three things are taken for granted. Mm. Today in the world, there are more people dying from obesity than because of starvation. And that was not true 100 years ago. So to my... Uh, interest in keeping my engineering core going is I like energy. Mm. I really, really, really love energy. And serving that energy to make it a sustainable energy when you have seven, eight billion people is an important futuristic industry. We cannot sustain the kind of living that we are doing. I mean, uh, we, we, you, all of you are in the IT space. The reason you are in the IT space is all of the data centers that suck a ton of energy is done somewhere in remote. It is not in your bedrooms or in your homes where you turn on a switch and you are paying for it. Somebody else is paying for it. The society is paying for it and that data center is powering all of your requirements and not only one data center, some of them have huge redundancies. They have five, six, they have, they have to copy all of this so that if one goes down, the other one is readily available. So I think the energy space is a, and we are transforming Right now, in the last 15 years, the world is going through a transformation because of climate change. Because that we have to, it's not, it's going to become a crisis if we don't transform our energy usage from fossil fuel to sustainable sources. So, I mean, I've, you know, when, when I was in Texas Instruments, I took initiatives for energy, sustainable energy there as well. 
it's it's inevitable that we have to do that in the next 15 to 20 years and india is a huge population huge growth population and we have to be able to bring that uh, sus sustainable methods of of energy harvesting so that we can power these data centers did i answer your question wish wish there are there are people sorry the people who are evaluating the career choices now what in young engineers there is a lot of attraction to go to it because of immediate job availability and immediate income etc which uh, which is not necessarily the uh, may not be the right option for them in the long term but people are forced to and in some cases compelled to do that because of the availability of jobs in the it sector versus non it now it is a difficult decision that they have to make and a lot of students come to me for ask this question and what i often tell them is that if there is a immediate need for you to make money then you really don't have a choice but if you are willing to take the long long term approach maybe there are other opportunities but it's very difficult for me to give you real examples of people who have succeeded uh, maybe we are not aware of the success of people who are in non uh, non it field because it field tends to get the most visibility Uh, so specifically for those people who are going to be needing the answer to that question uh, what can we offer as experienced uh, alumni engineers in terms of the choices they can make sure uh, i mean again uh, I, i can give you hvac is a is a industry in india that is has created a lot of jobs right mm. in uh, air conditioning uh, uh, jobs have have mushroomed in the last uh, 15 20 years mainly because all these buildings require uh, some level of uh, movement of air and similarly um, uh, energy is with solar energy especially uh, localized energy generation is easily possible and today it, that was not possible even 20 years ago today uh, in india you know you can pretty much become completely independent cut off your from the grid uh, if you if you can engineer that and uh, the career path for for that kind of an engineer yeah is going to be long i mean uh, it's not going to be as easy as you have said in the it field you get a job right away and um, the the energy field if you can convince and that is that is enough uh, people with money in india too who you can go and convince that hey i'm giving you energy independence for your home hmm. put solar for your home design it pay for it and you don't have to worry about power cuts hmm. now and that's a fairly good uh, business model now it is certainly a very good uh, career path but i, I we, the minute you have a a country that is dependent on a singular uh, what do you say industry uh, when things change that can become a disastrous uh, decision diversification will surely help i think from a country standpoint i agree you now we uh, we few things we have we have issues in the country one is that we produce way too many engineers than what we need we produce more engineers in one state than most countries produce uh, in a year and secondly we produce engineers without without having any idea how to how to use them now the amount of jobs available in the country is clearly a lot less than the number of engineers we are producing in a year uh, No, so that, that's a problem that has been created because if you remember back when we were studying in Tamil Nadu there was all of only about seven engineering colleges and right. annually we used to produce about maybe about couple of thousand engineers whereas now we are producing couple of lakh engineers only in Tamil Nadu alone uh, so this causes the problem of people going to different streams during studying but when they come out of college they don't have the opportunities to pursue jobs in the stream they study so particularly civil and mechanical seem to have uh, mechanical to some extent better than civil but civil for example and other other departments 
uh, have very few opportunities compared to the number of students they have and and these guys really suffer so uh, i think we need to create an uh, create a, a opportunity stream for them to that extent i'm trying to make sure that people who are not in it who are successful alumni to talk more about that so that people can get inspired and get into the field which is the reason i asked this question uh, in the particular uh, in this particular instance yeah i and, and very good question and I, I think i may not give you the the answer that you need because um, it is not you know sugar candy it, uh, when you when it is a career you have to it is it has a long term uh, implication to it and uh, you know an, an example i can give you mm. um, history majors are being graduated a lot from harvard university did you know that no yeah so there are lots and lots of people from harvard university who just to give you this the chief justice of the us supreme court is a ba history major from harvard university mm. Mm. so the reason i give that example is to be an extremely good historian can take you 30 35 years you graduate when you're 21 your time to shine will be somewhere in the late 50s hmm. some career paths take a long time for that threshold to to occur hmm. if you can stick with that threshold the problem is many hist history majors they figure that hey me earning minimum wage is insufficient and they wear away into other fields forget about history they become salesmen or insurance agents <laughs> uh so uh, on the other hand a computer scientist his ability to shine is between 21 and 35 when he's 35 36 he's almost obsolete I know many many I mean I graduated from one of a premier computer science colleges I know several computer scientists who are half of what they were when they were between 21 and 35 mm. because when you are 35 this huge software company can hire a 21 year old mm. to go through the 20 hour grad school kind of methodology for another 14 years and then spit him out when he's mm. 35 Hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if I've given you the the answer that you want, but I think uh, it is immediate satis as you have recognized is it immediate satisfaction over uh, satisfaction that you have built something. I mean, to, to tell you something, the reason I started my own company is I was tired of working. my heart off for a corporation that treated me as a number mm. Mm. that leads to my next question i was going to ask you you heard it made a transition from being an employee of a company of a large company uh, to an uh, entrepreneur so a lot of our alumni a lot of our students uh, are very interested in entrepreneurship after seeing all the recent success stories in the media etc all that but that transition from uh, corporate employee or employee of a company to running your own business uh, is 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 quite challenging so maybe you can share a little bit of experience on that transition from employee to entrepreneurship okay uh one thing that i do want to what do you say uh re uh what do you say uh, re uh, meet your your uh, word that i am successful i don't regard myself as success I regard myself as a work in progress. Uh success is very is is an event. To me uh if success is an event I don't want it. I want success to be a journey. Mm. I mean 
that's why my company is very different than any of the companies that i want and that i'm building mm. my company is a probably one of the most green companies in the planet mm. Mm. okay we don't talk about it but we practice that we are a very tiny company mm. but we i enjoy it the people who work in my enjoy what they do and that's the culture that i want to build so uh to to answer your question uh on what uh what is it that we should do to encourage these young people to take on non it uh fields i would uh, say but not only non it but also going from being employment to entrepreneurship as well yeah and uh, employment to ent- entrepreneurship is uh i mean again I, i you have to be very very lucky in that and i'm i would say i hit a huge jackpot on all of those um and that I mean, I, I I've been fiercely independent all 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 my years, uh, even when I was at Kindi, and uh, my independence um, to to be on my own, to build something on my own, uh, is is what brought me to this. And the corporate world uh, is. is great i would not uh, say it is not it it gives you a good platform it gives you the ability to learn uh, how to work in teams it uh, helps you to uh, delegate it helps helps you to uh, work with uh, different uh, diverse groups uh, and so on those are all uh, skills and talents that i did not have and i uh, was able to acquire them uh, on the other hand uh, after you have acquired them what are you going to do with it and that's when i said hey i need to do something for myself and build something that is uh unique uh we have certain patterns in our company that are extremely unique uh and that's how i have made the transition from an employee to an employer you know i think uh, it is di- very 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 difficult to be an employer because um there are the buck stops here with me if something goes wrong it's my i mean it is not anybody else's fault it is it is mine so i have to own it i have to be able to correct those faults and success is typically i have to share with everybody so that's the uh so the, and and i love it i i thoroughly thoroughly enjoy every second of what i'm doing today it is highly stressful but it is it brings so much pleasure because when i go and do an installation in j- just to give you we are the only company that has installed in a synagogue in a mosque in a hindu temple presbyterian church lutheran church a s- solar system and i know these systems are going to last well past mauli's death probably 30 35 years that's a legacy that very few it engineers can mm. can give mm. I mean I worked on a 65 nanometer technology at TI it's already obsolete I have right. you know it's I have no legacy there mm. but this one I mean I can drive you to these locations and they are assets that are going to be there make energy for 30 to 40 years mm. Mm. interesting interesting so let's look at the questions in the line here um, i think few of them i already asked you based on what i read there but let me read the question that is uh, out there 
uh, somebody asking about zero carbon initiatives uh, who asked the question can you please uh, unmute and ask the question so let me ask the question uh, anyway Molly. Uh, so the question reads uh, with the push for zero carbon initiatives what do you see as the future of solar industry will solar be competitive with other forms of alternate energy okay what is the first question was uh, the first part was with the, with the first part is with the push for zero carbon initiatives what do you see as the future of the solar industry so obviously solar industry is going to be a big part of the zero carbon so the question i think the question i believe they ask is that how do you see that fitting into the how do you see solar industry fitting into the zero carbon initiatives vis-a-vis -vis other forms of uh, alternate energy sure um, to put you put in perspective if we were to if we had the potential to harness every photon that came from the sun in one hour we could power the entire planet for an entire year mm. that's the amount of energy that is coming from our sun mm. and it is inevitable that we will have to use that source in the next 20 to 50 years <clears throat> and yeah we may have different materials that today silicon is the most prevalent material there is research being done on other materials but none of it has proven to be as reliable and cost effective as silicon and uh, I am very, very, very confident solar energy will be there for many years to come into the future. Hmm. What, is the, so, what is the what what is the share of solar in terms of total energy production vis-a-vis -vis other non-fossil fuels? Uh, what the world or in in localized areas? In general, in general, in the world. In the world, it's probably less than one percent today. Okay. Okay. Okay, in in the U.S. again, it is probably in the neighborhood of two to three percent, mm. but it is the only industry that is growing while fossil fuel is being shut down. Mm. So f the growth is 10x. So the transformation in the next 15 years would be that almost 80 percent would be from non-fossil fuel sources, which mm. which will include uh, solar, wind, and hydro, and possibly some nuclear. Mm. Okay, because the uh, you see people talking about you know, transforming from fuel fossil fuels, but when it comes to a difficult situation like right now, with a lot of uh, shortage of uh, this thing, people are still going to fossil fuels, right? When Russia turned off the natural gas, then every country in the world which is talking about you know, moving to non-fossil fuels is rushing back into fossil fuels with a rage. Uh, so even this, you know, can solar, wind and other forms of energy uh, grow su sufficiently enough to become an alternate source? Oh, 100 percent. I'm not even, I mean, just to give you, if you take... Um, probably one-tenth of Tamil Nadu land area and you put solar in that one-tenth of that space, it can power the entire country. Mm -hmm. in, in what do you say, I just want to give you uh, uh, an idea of what space solar uh, footprint is required. So that possibility is there, but it is not leveraged for some reason. Yeah, le leveraging is, again, those are all beyond our uh, paycheck because um, what is, I mean, what a, a country prioritizes as, as, um, as a country or a state prioritizes its 
economics is very uh, what do you say politically driven i mean i can give you an example in tamil nadu but i don't i don't think it will be politically correct <laughs> the largest industry in tamil nadu is not it mm. is probably not and you probably know what it is mm. it is exactly. not politically correct to give it give it give, give that out mm. right and and it it provides lakhs and lakhs of crores of revenue to the state yeah one of the most important and, resources actually for the state exactly <laughs> and 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 so what when the the cost effectiveness is purely a political uh, thing and that's the beauty of solar is um solar does not need large uh you know if if you're putting i mean i mean partha is in kanyakumari and he does not I mean i think there is a nuclear plant near kanyakumari too but they they don't really have to build these huge inf- infrastructure over there they can make it all localized mm. and that means they don't have to uh, wheel in coal or you know other fossil fuels every day the reason and the infrastructure to to wheel all of these from one place to the other is a huge burden while solar and wind can be localized locally produced mm. so uh when you go into the cost aspects those are all uh, how a country would put economic what do you say importance to one over the other the beauty of solar is because the world has recognized solar is an important industry and it needs to be put everywhere if one country if india says hey i'm not going to do solar they would be a pariah if america i mean america energy is really dirt cheap america does not need solar energy at all hmm. but if we don't do solar in the us we will be a pariah we will be, every country in the world will call the us out for its non use of solar so uh i think that's the good thing about solar the prices as the number of countries and number of people and number of industries start to use solar the prices has going to come down and that's exactly what has happened in the last 10 years i mean when i started my company mm. the prices i sold were 3x what i'm selling today in just 10 years or 11 12 years my prices are one third of what i started off mm. Hmm. and it is all because component prices have come down is it still competitive with uh, grid energy or other forms of energy it's very competitive hmm. extremely competitive because you don't have any operational cost right once you put it you are not you remember i told you you have to wheel all of this coal you have to wheel natural gas I mean again natural gas need not be a fossil fuel source hmm. Mm. um natural gas can be you know can be created in your own house if you have enough I mean in your own locality if you have enough composting materials mm. uh and if the community decides that they are all going to put that com- composting in one location and <coughs> that compost can create sufficient natural gas <coughs> over time so natural gas need not be a non I mean need not be a fossil fuel source it can be a, a sequestered source mm-hmm. super <coughs> thanks molly i think we are almost to end of the call um, we try to finish it on time uh, it's been interesting we had people as i told you people joined and left the call and joined over time as well this is very common but the call is indeed recorded so for those who uh, want to watch the call it will be available on a public youtube channel cg connect uh, very shortly partha will do some edit on the uh, raw video and then publish it in the next uh, over the next few days but it was fascinating molly it's good to see you after a very long time and 
Same now, here. Yes. And 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 we do have we did have a couple of our batchmates join in between. I don't know if you noticed that Guna was there for a while, Panit Selam was there for a while in between. Uh, sure. But I guess because they had to leave uh, Sunday evenings could be a different difficult time for some people. But at least they joined. Again, thanks all of you for joining the call today. Uh, we are going to continue with this. Uh, the next session will be in uh, August. I'm working on some speakers for August, and there are quite a few good choices available. So I'll let you know guys about that shortly. And in terms of the feedback about the uh, the program itself, as well as this individual session, please do write to us. Um, you can write to us through the CG Connect portal. Uh, there are places for you to write comments on uh, the program, opportunities to improve the program, opportunities to improve uh, any aspect of the program, whether it is the, the timing or the methodology or uh, how you want to see it. Uh, we want to improve the program because we, the idea of this program is for the purpose of alumni and students. And so it's primarily for them to, uh, and specifically young alumni and students. So, so anything that you want, you guys want to see in the program that would be more useful to you, uh, we would love to hear that. And we would like to incorporate that as well. Uh, people have talked about the registration process. We still kept the registration via the portal. Uh, people want to see if they can join without registering. And we are trying to, we are evaluating that opportunity, but uh, for now, we're going to keep it the way it is right now. But the the uh, recording of the call is always available for free with no re no registration. Anybody can go to the public YouTube channel and watch the recording. So you do get the content without having to register. But for you to join the live call, you do have to register. That's the policy we are following right now. Uh, just for information's sake, the CG Connect program that I'm running, we also have other uh, initiatives that run from that. There's another one called CG Field Insights. Some of you might have joined other Field Insights program. Field Insights is where we again we are bringing in alumni who have deep subject matter expertise in any one particular vertical to talk more about that business, how is the business running, details of the business, and again focus on what are the entrepreneurship, research, and uh, employment opportunities in that business. So we've done a few sessions on manufacturing, on electric vehicle, on uh, crypto, etc. All that. We're planning to do one on uh, on. Uh, on uh, cyber security very soon. I identified one of our alumni who's an expert in cyber security in the US. So I'm planning to arrange for that session probably in the next couple of three weeks. So stay tuned for that. And again, please welcome your feedback for the program as well as the uh, as well as the particular session. Okay. With that